the, um, do your development from, where your client object is going to communicate through the stub, and the stub's going to take care of communicating to the rest of the layers to get to your server object. And the stub needs to be passed around by the developers or by the administrator, it needs to be available to you to actually use the RMI service. And then you just have your custom clients, whatever kind of wraparound you want to do, that's going to end up communicating with the business logic on the server side. But there's one kind of fundamental flaw in parts of the RMI architecture. Because it's kind of assumed that without the stub, you can't talk to the business logic on the other side. The stub contains a lot of secrets. But imagine you had the ability to create your own stub to be able to just interact with any RMI service you felt, you felt free you wanted to do. Well, it is actually possible. Because there's serious fundamental flaws in the skeleton layer. And this is going to allow us to create our own stub and we can create our own client to talk to the business logic on the server. Now, just before we begin attacking an RMI service, there's a quick two kind of details you need to be aware of, which is the RMI registry. And you run the RMI registry on the server, it's a separate process, and this is where you bind your objects to, and this is how um, other developers and the clients know how to communicate with your server. They need to know that there's an object sitting on the server side, and need to know how to make references to it, very much like any uh, typical distributed computing technology. So the server registers their objects, and then the clients retrieve a name from the server to get a remote reference, and they can start talking to it, provided they have this stub. And by default, um, it runs on port 1099. So I mentioned earlier about the stub and the skeleton. These get generated by the RMIC tool. And this is one of the tools which generates the uh, kind of the, fun, uh, the flawed code. So you generate the stub and the skeleton, and you're going to distribute this stub over to all your clients. And now your skeleton, with all the code flaws in, is going to sit on your server side, and you're going to build off this kind of a weak layer. So you can use, to set up your registry, you can use the RMI registry command, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with when setting up your RMI service, or you can just do it at the API level. And one other very important detail about how RMI communicates is that it uses a 64-bit hash. So kind of with web services, it uses method names, and it has particular details it needs to send over the server so it knows what you need to communicate. And with RMI, it uses 64-bit hash. So you pass your 64-bit hash from the client. This is all detail that is generated for you and stored in the stub layer. And this will go over to the server side. And it'll be based on the hash and a couple of more details, it'll determine which method it needs to execute at the business logic layer. So this is a kind of critical detail, being able to map out the business logic and knowing how your client's going to communicate with your server. Now, the SHA hash is actually generated using a method name and method descriptor. So you can see I have an example there. Unfortunately, it's kind of fuzzy. But the idea is that the method descriptor is passed in, SHA1 hash is generated, and there's no seed. So you can actually generate these hashes based on people's IPA, API documentation. So if I knew certain methods that are residing on your server, I can generate the hashes. I know your keys. And this is all about the hash weakness. The fact that you can pre-calculate hashes. If you get hold of someone's API documentation, you can start building these keys, and he's going to give you access to talk to the RMI service. And it's 64-bit, OK? You're not going to brute force a 64-bit range overnight. There's 18 trillion combinations. But actually, for doing more analysis on this, it's not actually 64-bit. Some have done a kind of funny implementation on the SHA hash, and they've shifted a few bits around. I don't know why. Um, and the entropy is a lot lower. So I'm still doing the analysis on this, but already there's at least two trillion keys that are missing. So it's taken the attack factor down uh, greatly. So if you're going to attack an RMI service, what do we need? We need to be able to communicate with the registry. So we need to know what are the bound object names. We need to know what's the stub name. As we've seen, you need a stub and a corresponding skeleton. And these names must, must match up. Otherwise, the stub and the skeleton won't communicate. And as I just spoke about with the 64-bit key, this is going to give you access to the service. So we need to retrieve this detail as well. Okay. 
and obviously you need to retrieve the method prototypes. You need to understand what Sorry about that. <laughs> So I was talking about the method prototypes. So very much is when you want to interact with a web service, you need to know what the function calls are. And we've got to determine this detail as well, because you've got the business logic layer, there's some functions hosted, but how do you know what to pass to it, what are the return types? So obviously this is a critical kind of piece of information to know how to talk to the business logic layer. And also the tools will only give you so much detail, but it's enough detail to code your own client, so you need to have a bit of a Java coding experience, and you can start knocking up your clients and really start attacking the RMI service. So today, I'm going to host an RMI service. I'm going to do uh, host three methods. So I'm going to show you the implementation of that. I'm also going to take a big chance, and I'm going to do a live presentation. There's no videos. So I'm going to host this RMI service, and we're going to attack it. So you know, please bear with me if any kind of fat fingers or any silly mistakes I make. So we're going to work through this RMI assessment methodology, which I've put together. And this is how we kind of um, perform an assessment within Corsair. So first step, we need to know that the RMI service is there and what is the uh, remote object name. So we're going to do a demonstration now. We're going to quickly set up the RMI server. So you can see, um, I, no, you can't see. But <laughs> Okay, so that says, uh, we'll just, um, I'll pull it across a bit. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the command is start RMI registry. And as I talked about earlier, you need to create your registry. You can either do it using a process or at the API level. So we're going to start that process. And now it's just sitting there on port 1099, and you're going to register your objects into the registry. So it's not a particular interest now. It's just going to help us get our RMI service running. And we are now going to start our RMI service. So you execute your class. Um, so people who are familiar with um, developing RMI services, you see that you actually just run Java with your business logic, which implements certain interfaces, and you've extended certain classes. But I'm not going to go into the detail of how you actually implement an RMI service. There's plenty of tutorials to do that. So it's, uh Gonna have to do this, it doesn't all fit on the screen. Okay, so as I st said, step one of the methodology is to retrieve the bound object names. I'm sorry about the kind of quality of the slides. I don't know what's happened. I think you can read that. So we're going to run the first uh, tool in the suite, which I've developed, as just called RMI, RMI by bound objects. Very kind of simple tool to set up as well.